The entire Bible is a more sure word. Peter seemed to imply that this word is more sure than even his experience on that mountaintop with Christ. That is a sobering thing to ponder. Experiences can be a powerful thing, but as believers in Christ, experiences will not supersede the more sure prophetic word, and that word is the Bible. For those who have been affected in any way by my previous words, I repent. I was sincere in those times, but I was sincerely wrong. I was a false prophet, but thanks be to God for his mercy and grace, I now know the truth. That is my prayer for those who will read my blog, and may God get all the glory. You just heard an excerpt from my latest blog post featured on Love Subscribe. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Subscribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Subscribe. I want to read with you several verses in 2 Peter, beginning with verse 16. I'll be reading from the ESV. Peter says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This passage right here, these these several verses, uh, came to my mind, to my remembrance, within the past week or so, and I'll tell you why, and uh, for those that have read my blog post, you'll understand where I'm coming from, and you may have even seen a Facebook Live that I did recently, uh, repenting, because I was coming to the uh, understanding in the past year that I was a false prophet. Uh, I ministered words that I thought that God was speaking to me, and I even penned God's name to them, saying the Lord spoke this or the Lord spoke that. And I never tested it against Scripture. I never tested it against the the Word of God that is the more sure prophecy, the more sure prophetic Word. I never tested it. And I interpreted Scripture. I twisted and took Scripture out of context, and I made it to fit my own interpretation. And we can just see here in 2 Peter 1, in in that passage, that it is not by man's interpretation. So this will probably be one of the more personal and difficult podcast episodes that I will have to do. But it's necessary to do this, and I want to do this to bring other people to the realization of the truth. I'm not condemning anybody. I want to just make it known that we need to be paying attention to what is truth. If we proclaim to be Christians, then the foundation that we stand upon, our instruction, must go back to the Word of God. The reason I'm doing this is that over the past year, after coming out of the hyper-charismatic church and what many call the New Apostolic Reformation, I had to face the truth that I was a false prophet. And when we hear the term false prophet, we immediately think of someone who is inaccurate, that they're greedy, that they're trying to take advantage of people. And though that is part of it, and let me just say this, even though there were things that I said that I I now realize were not right, they were not from God, and I was sincere about it, I did not want to gain anything financially from anybody. I wanted to glorify God. I wanted to draw people into intimacy with Christ. But I didn't understand that what I was doing was not biblically based, and it wasn't being tested. So though we we see and we know when we hear false prophet, we immediately think of that. Well, this person's inaccurate. Their words never came to pass, right? That's the definition of a false prophet. That's not the whole definition. We find in the Bible that there were prophets who were accurate, but they were leading people away from God. I want to read to you just to show you this. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 13. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. 
You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. I want you to notice something. The prophets that were speaking in Deuteronomy 13 were accurate. But the thing is, is that they were drawing people away from the one true and living God. And this is going on today in the hyper charismatic NAR church. They may not be saying, let us go after other gods, but when they're telling you to rely on extra biblical revelation, when someone is telling you, like I once did, that you need to listen because the Lord says this or says that, and it's not in scripture, it's not tested by scripture, it's not founded upon scripture, and furthermore, what's even more important, it's not pointing you to the gospel of Jesus Christ, then that is not true, and it is to be rejected. You see, accuracy is not the only indicator of a prophet of God that we see in the Bible. A true prophet was also to be leading the people back to God. We can see this in prophets of the Old Testament with Isaiah, Ezekiel, Elijah, Jeremiah, Jonah. I mean, my goodness, Jonah even did not want, he was reluctant. He did not want to go and minister to the people of Nineveh, but he went to minister repentance. That is the core of the gospel message, the gospel when it is proclaimed. John the Baptist said it. Jesus said it. It was a call to repentance for the forgiveness of sins. They came to the people of Israel. These prophets did. They came to the people of Israel with a call to repent and return to the Lord. These men were types and shadows of Jesus, who Hebrews speaks of saying, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days... He has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. That is in Hebrews chapter one, verse one. And this was actually in the past year coming out of this movement. That was one of the scriptures as I read that it really confounded and started working on me and in me realizing, wow, some of the things I've been saying, I was saying I was a prophet because that's what I was told I was by an apostle in the movement I was in. But realizing that what I was doing was, was not according to scripture. So I wanted to share a little bit of this with you, what led to this podcast. And and it's going to be, like I said, it's one of the going to be more of the difficult ones that I've done. But what happened was over the past couple weeks, actually last Sunday, I received an email from someone who was thanking me for a prophetic word that a, a charismatic media outlet had shared. And as they were sharing this and saying it confirmed some things that 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 was going on in their life and what they were feeling and how and and what God was speaking to them I began to really feel nauseous I was really bothered it was like a pit developed in the core of my stomach as I was reading this email and it was a very nice and sincere email but it was another realization for me that what I was doing in the past was not glorifying God. It was not proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was not drawing people back to the one true and living God. If anything, it was pointing people back to me and and how my words were so deep and so relevant and so mystical. And as I was reading that email, the realization hit me that this was another thing that I was going to have to repent of in my life and publicly because this was a public word that was released. So as I went to the the website or the the social media site where this this post was it was shared, I noticed in the past 24 hours the same site had shared three of my blog posts. And these blog posts were recycled words. They were not new ones that I had put out because my writing had changed over the past year because of the conviction that I had come under by the Holy Spirit. And I had removed a lot of those blog posts in the past months from my site because I didn't want people being led astray. And I realized in that moment after seeing those three and then a a link to a fourth one in 24-hour time frame that I had to address this publicly. You see, I had been thinking, well, you know, at that moment, I'm trying to rationalize it and think, well, maybe they'll, they'll come to my site and they'll hear the gospel. And that was just ignorant. That wasn't that was me trying to not be responsible. And I had to realize that and come to terms with that. Even though I knew and I had changed, I had repented, I had turned from those ways, I was turning back to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was still trying to ignore the problem, thinking it would just go away, that if people, maybe if they saw those words, they would come to my site and they would really see the gospel being ministered and they would wonder why things had changed. 
But that's not how that works. We have to be willing to admit when we've done wrong. And especially with public things like that, public ministry, that had to be addressed publicly. So I did a few things that evening. I emailed the person that had emailed me and I repented to them and apologized and said that they should not listen to any other blog post that I had done in the past like that and that they needed to get back into the word of God. The second thing I did was I found an old email from where I had had given them permission for this media site to share my posts and I emailed them and asked them to not share them anymore, including the older posts. And the last thing I did, which was really hard, I got on Facebook Live and I shared a public repentance to people and admitted that I was a false prophet. (sighs) That's been humbling, to say the least. And coming out of a very painful and trying time last year, I studied the Word of God and I realized that what I had engaged in was Gnosticism. This is not a new practice. In fact, this was a major threat to the early church. You may not know what Gnosticism is, so I want to tell you a little bit about it. I'm not an expert, (laughs) but I will share a little bit of what I know. Gnosticism is a focus on secret knowledge. It creates a superiority among people, those who hear God outside the confines of Scripture, and it provides secret knowledge and teachings that only divine people can comprehend. There also, whether intended or not, is an exaltation of this secret knowledge. There was also a focus on intimacy with Christ when I would when I would write these words or I would minister publicly. And though I talked about the importance of worshiping him and showing him reverence, in all honesty, I was being irreverent in my portrayal of him as almost like a boyfriend rather than my savior. There's a lot of this talk and we may not think about that, but there's a lot of this romanticism in Christianity in some of these movements. Treating Jesus as our boyfriend or that he's our significant other or lover or or using these intimate terms, and we are being irreverent. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Yes, we are the bride of Christ, and he is the bridegroom. We are never to forget what he did for us on the cross the finished work on the cross as our Lord and Savior, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. We must be cognizant of that and aware that we are to pay reverence, reverential fear to God and for what he's done for us and to not take it lightly and to not tarnish that relationship that he's reconciled us back to the Father because the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit They are to be reverenced and to not be diminished in who they are. I focused on hearing the next revelation from God, or so I thought. I would look for ways God was speaking to me rather than reading the word of God and hearing and studying what he had already said through those. He had, as Peter said about the scriptures, men who spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. There's this tendency right now and it's not just in the hyper charismatic churches but it's 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 widespread it's like gangrene there is this tendency to open the bible put our finger on a verse and to apply it to something in our lives and to say that's what it meant and to give it multiple meanings when we are really to open our bibles and to read it in context i encourage you just as a side note when you're reading the bible a good practice would be to start with is to read the verses. If you're focusing on one particular verse, maybe you've heard a verse in the church that you've been in and that it's been said that it means a certain thing. I encourage you to read the verses, 10 verses before it and 10 verses after it at least. So that way you can get a good context of what is going on. Because I am telling you right now, as someone who is in this movement, this is being done frequently. And we are not drawing people back to Jesus Christ. This gnosis that I was speaking of was to bring the truth about my identity and others as well who read my blog posts. I want to read you something real quick from a Bible dictionary that talks about gnosis or Gnosticism. It says here in this Bible dictionary, when one received the gnosis or true knowledge, one became aware of one's true identity with a divine inner self was set free, in parentheses, saved from the dominion of the inferior creator God and was enabled to live as a true child of the absolute and superior deity. So this is talking about 
and it even goes on to say salvation was thus seen by the Gnostics in a cosmic rather than a moral context. And Gnosticism, there were things about Gnosticism when I read through this, I think, well, whether I inadvertently did that or not, I was not focusing on certain aspects of it. But a big thing with Gnosticism, too, is that there's this uh, disdain for the carnal. And really, you're supposed to be um, reaching for the spiritual. That is the ultimate goal. And it's almost like this deification of man also. this um, When I talked about having this secret knowledge and that there's only so many divine people or individuals that can do that. I'm seeing this a lot in the hyper charismatic church. There are people that come up and they say, well, God told me this, or God showed me a dream, or he showed me a vision. And I would just like to point to you in Jude 8, that Jude even warns in there of false teachers that will come up and they're relying on their dreams. We are never told to lot rely on our dreams. I did the same thing. I remember blog posts that I wrote that these media outlets picked up of dreams I had. And these dreams were very real, but that doesn't mean that God was speaking to me. And it also doesn't mean that was prescriptive for my life. And it doesn't mean that I was supposed to interpret them. And there's a lot of time spent trying to interpret dreams, trying to interpret visions. And we're avoiding the scripture. We're avoiding the Bible in context, and this is why people are having issues in their daily lives, not knowing how to conduct themselves as Christians. We're more focused on the supernatural. We're more focused on dreams and visions, signs, wonders, miracles, and such, and that's a whole other topic for another day that we can talk about. When we're focused on all those things and we're wanting those things more than we want to know how to to be a godly wife, be a godly mother, how to be just a disciple of Jesus Christ and know how to conduct ourselves, how to resist the devil, not fall into the traps of having to to do, uh, jump through hoops and do all these things that God never told us that we had to do, but to rely on him and to trust in his word and to turn to his word for instruction. We don't worship the word, but we recognize what the word is supposed to do. It sets boundaries for us to follow so that we are continuously on the path of sanctification while we're in this world. And that we're drawing closer to Christ through that sanctification. We're being set apart. So that way we don't do the things that God tells us not to do in his word. And in that we are glorifying him in word and deed. Not because we have to. Not because we're earning our way to heaven. But we do good works because we were created to do good works by God after we know him by grace through faith in Christ alone. So what essentially happens is a focus on self in Gnosticism, for example. And finding your identity rather than being conformed to the image of Christ in accordance with proper biblical understanding. Something I do not think that those who tell of extra biblical revelation realize is that they are engaging in practices such as these. And though we can be sincere, we can be sincerely wrong. That's where I was. I was sincere. I loved the Lord. But I was sincerely wrong in what I was doing. I wasn't willingly trying to deceive anyone. But I was deceived in, my, in, in myself, and I was deceiving others. I was not pointing them back to Jesus Christ. I was not proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was not reading and studying the word of God in context. And I was not glorifying God in the process. I was essentially ministering another gospel, another Christ that couldn't save, but wanted to tell people how awesome they were, and to conform them to their own image and find their own identity rather than being conformed to the image of Christ. And I repent for that. The word of God is to be the absolute final authority for instruction as a Christian. I have seen ministers tell of dreams and visions predicting national and world events while sprinkling God's name in the proclamation. But there is no proclamation of the gospel and pointing people to the truth of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. There is no call to trust in Christ alone for faith. Rather, when I see this stuff, the call is to recognize the accuracy of the prophet in their visions and dreams, to draw attention back to them for the answers for the world's problems, or to proclaim a vague and generalized prophetic word that applies to a number of people, and when it resonates with people on an emotional level, it is deemed spot on. It happened to me. I'm telling you from experience, humbly telling you from experience, that this is what I was engaging in. And again, I was born again believer and thought that I was speaking on behalf of the Lord because I thought I was a prophet and I was a false prophet. I say that not in condemnation, 
but in my own conviction of pride and being a false prophet. When we are pointing people back to ourselves and what we have to say rather than what God has said through his word and it testifying of Christ Jesus and understanding our need for a savior and how to conduct ourselves as disciples of Christ, this hurts people. And I don't mean it hurts their feelings. I mean, we're talking about doing eternal damage that we are leading people astray. Or when something is not accurate or even way off base, there is a reason or explanation given other than the truth. In the movement I was part of, people were told that they could be activated to prophesy and that it was okay to miss it. I was part of that. I remember even helping, thinking I was helping people to get activated to prophesy. You need, and telling people that you can, it was okay to miss it. You need to get it wrong so that you know how to tell God's voice from your own. The problem is with this is that we are telling people or implying that God is saying something when he is not in those instances. And we make God a liar. The Bible makes it clear that he is not a man that he should lie. The Bible also makes it clear that true prophets are always accurate. And they testify of God. Also, for those who believe in the continuation of the gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that the gifts are given by the Spirit as He wills. Nowhere in Scripture are we told that we can activate gifts, that we can will them into being. It is the Spirit that gives as He wills. They cannot be activated, purchased, or imparted. I want to encourage you to study the Word of God as part of your daily walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1.19 is a beautiful passage. Peter had a great experience as one of Christ's apostles, yet he says that there is a more sure prophetic word. And this word is not to be ignored because it is like a lamp shining in a dark place. It is not interpreted by man and based on our own understanding. He tells of this because the apostles faced issues with Gnosticism in their time and confronting this trying to infiltrate the church. What needs to be proclaimed in the church and by the church is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the full gospel. The full gospel has a call to repentance from sin. The full gospel lovingly tells people who are unbelievers that the wrath of God abides on them as children of wrath. The full gospel ministers reconciliation by grace through faith in Christ alone. I have to tell you, I am so thankful for the mercy and the grace of God to grant repentance from sins and to right the course in my life. And it hasn't been an easy process. It has been quite painful. But it's been worth it. Because I got to be set free. John 8, 31, 32 has been a scripture that I've really held on to in this past year. And meditated on continuously. And it has brought great comfort in the midst of having to realize what I was doing. And what I was part of. John 8, 31, 32, when Jesus is speaking to those listening to him, he says, If you are truly my disciples, you will abide in my word. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And that's what happened to me over the past year. The Lord set me free from deception. I was a false prophet. And God opened my eyes to the truth and to trust in him and not my own experiences. His word is a light to my feet and a lamp unto my path. And though there has been sorrow and contrition, there is joy in him because the truth has set me free. And this whole time, this time of almost two decades, believing certain things that were not rooted in scripture, God is going to redeem this time, so to speak. He's going to be glorified through it, regardless of what happened in the past. He is going to use it for his glory And I pray that there are people that hear this that will come out of these types of movements. They will come back to their Bibles. They will return to Jesus Christ. They will come to the full knowledge of who Jesus is. I do believe that there are are people that are saved in these movements. There's been deception that's come. And I pray that they will hear this, that this message will go to them. They will have ears to hear it. They will look in their Bibles. They will search the scripture to see what is the truth. And that they will be led through the truth and the truth will set them free. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and on Instagram at lovesickscribe. And if you enjoy reading, feel free to hop on over to lovesickscribe.com and subscribe to my blog. 
I've enjoyed being with you today, and I look forward to our next time together as we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and we continue to grow together in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.